Good evening. It's great to be with you tonight. Um, looking forward to our devotion tonight. We are in Galatians and we are doing our daily devotional scripture that encourages you to pray. We started this as a response to the pandemic and being shut down and shut out of our sanctuary. Um, and we've just, by God's grace, been able to keep going. And it's great to to share with you. Uh, we're in Galatians chapter 4. Uh, really looking forward to it. We're going to be looking at uh, verses 8 to 20. I've got uh, three sections highlighted that we're going to look at tonight. And so really looking forward to sharing with God, with this, with you from God's Word. I want to encourage you to get out your Bibles and get out your pen, your paper, so you can follow along. I think God's going to lay wisdom on your heart and you want to capture that when He does because that's what He does through the Word by the power of the Holy Spirit. And I want to encourage you to use lots of positive emojis, hearts, thumbs up, smiley faces, all of those things. Uh, when you do that, you're doing the work of an evangelist, a modern day social media evangelist, because that boosts the rankings of this video uh, in Facebook's algorithm. And so uh, thanks for doing that. It's amazing to see the responses we're getting. Last time I checked in the last 28 days, according to Facebook uh, analytics, we had over 6,000 people watch uh, our, see our videos for worship and devotions, and we just praise God for that. Just, just amazing. We just praise God for that. Um, yeah, yeah. There's a wonderful prayer information card on our, on our Facebook page there. Sarah Chang put another wonderful one up there. Check it out. Share it. Encourage people to pray. Encourage people to take advantage of that resource. We're going to pray. When we pray tonight, I've got a couple prayer requests. And so if you would, I'd like to ask you to jot these down. Um, a friend of mine that I grew up with in Nigeria, he's a pastor in the Lutheran Church of Nigeria. His name is Gregory Ona. He reached out and asked for prayers. And so I want to, uh, we're going to pray for him. I want to ask you, all you who are watching tonight's broadcast, whether you watch it tonight or tomorrow, whenever, uh, pray for Pastor Gregory Ona and all the Christians in Nigeria. Also, I want to ask you to pray for our ministry that God is opening up for us in Waukegan and in North Chicago. Just been blessed to have some wonderful conversations with mayors and uh, with the mayors there and uh, senior staff. And God's just opened up some amazing doors for ministry. Had another amazing conversation today and uh, a lot of stuff in the works. So just ask for your prayers for that. Also, uh, yesterday, last night, got to do my first uh, Hispanic ministry theological training, and uh, it was just wonderful. Uh, we had four people in the training, and so I praise God for that, and want to encourage you to, to pray for our Hispanic outreach. And then this weekend, we're going to be down in Gary, Indiana, working with our network support missionary that we support, uh, Pastor Del Campbell, awesome guy. Uh, if you're looking for a great ministry to support in the urban environment, uh, Pastor Del Campbell, uh, he's, he puts together one day mission trips. And so that's what we're doing. We're going down there. So check him out, talk to him. And uh, he's the real deal. All right, let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for today. We thank you for all of your blessings in our life. We thank you that we're connected with the body of Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. So Father, tonight we want to just lift up um, <clears throat> Pastor Gregory Ona in uh, Nigeria. We pray for all of our Christian brothers and sisters there. We pray for them, for their faith to be kept strong in the midst of the persecution that's happening there. We thank you for this technology that connects us with brothers and sisters in Christ all around the world. And so we just, we pray for them. And we thank you for their faithful witness and helping us to put our troubles in their proper perspective. Father, we pray also for our Hispanic ministry, for those that are being raised up. And uh, we, we just thank you for the privilege of sharing the gospel and working with brothers and sisters uh, in Christ in, in, in your vineyard. Father, we pray for our civic leaders and we lift up to you the cities of Waukegan and North Chicago and the ministry partnerships there. Thank you for the great conversation today. Pray for your wisdom and your direction. Father, we want to pray for Del Campbell, Pastor Del Campbell. Um, we just thank you for the partnership uh, that we have with him and for him to be blessed with just rock solid partnerships that support him and what you've called him to do there. Father, bless us in the word tonight as we're looking through Galatians. Speak to us by the power of the Holy Spirit. Let us hear from you tonight. Father, we pray all these things in Jesus' name, according to your will and for your glory. And all of God's children, we all say, 
Amen. Amen. Guys, it's just great to be in God's Word with you. I, I do want to just, I, we're going to jump into Galatians 4, but I, do, I just want to share with you something real quick here. Um, so one of the people in our Hispanic ministry training is a teenager, daughter uh, of one of the people in the training. Her first name's Nadia. She's bilingual. And so she translated my notes from last night into Spanish. And a uh, little, little Spanish check here for you. You can hear, um, I'll read the English and I'll try and read the Spanish. So like one of the points that I made is, Holy Scripture is God's word. <clears throat> so she translates here, I'm reading from the email from her. She translated that, La Sagrada Faith, La Palabra Nos Da Fe. If I'm not pronouncing anything correct, please forgive me. Um, then, uh, uh, we must agree, then study the word. That was one of the points then. Um, Debemos estar de esfuerzo, luego estudiar la palabra. So blessed. So blessed to be able to participate in the sharing of God's word. So with that said, let's jump into Galatians chapter 4. We're going to be looking at verses 8 to 20. I'm going to focus on a couple of verses in particular. So the first one I'm going to focus on with you is Galatians 4, uh, 10 to 11. And let me uh, read that for you. I'm going to be using the, uh, the ESV uh, translation, except for once, I believe I'm going to use the NIV. Uh, so Galatians 4, 10 to 11. Uh, Paul says to the churches in Galatia, you observe days and months and seasons and years. I am afraid I may have labored over you in vain. And so just again, the challenge with the churches in Galatia is that they were abandoning the gospel. They were abandoning the truth that we're saved by grace through faith, not by works. They were abandoning the truth that um, the righteous will live by faith and that the righteousness that we have is God's gift to us. They were abandoning that to go to legalism. And so Paul is again picking that up here. He says, you observe days and months and seasons and years. I am afraid I may have labored over you in vain. Uh, and it's kind of interesting when you do the, the study there, the Greek word that Paul uses for observe, as it's translated in the ESV, the Greek word that Paul uses for observe is not used anywhere else in Scripture regarding religious observances. I'll say that again. The word that the Apostle Paul uses for observe here in verse 10 is not used anywhere else in Scripture regarding religious observances. And so what is Paul sort of, cluing us in on here. It seems that Paul wants to emphasize that legalistically following religious calendars is misplaced. Um, he's diminishing the importance of it by using a word that's not even anywhere else used in regards to uh, religious observances. Uh, Paul was concerned, and in fact with good cause, that the Christians in Galatia could start demanding circumcision as a test of orthodoxy. So what, you know, uh, I think it's important for us here to, to recognize that we cannot elevate human tradition to restrict Christian freedom. We cannot elevate human tradition to restrict Christian freedom. Um, at the same time, neither do we have to abandon all tradition to prove our orthodoxy. See, you know, every road has two ditches, right? You can go too far to one side of the road and you wind up in a ditch. Uh, you go too far uh, to the other side of the road and you wind up in the opposite ditch. And so um, it, 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 in matters of Christian freedom, each Christian actually has just that, which is freedom. And, you know, my encouragement to brothers and sisters in Christ who really find a lot of meaning and value in tradition, you know, whether we're talking about liturgical tradition and worship or, or what have you, uh, as I do also, is to not try to be legalistic about it because that's not our understanding of, of worship, you know, is not to be legalistic about it, but rather instead to point to people what are the benefits? How do these traditions point us to the gospel? How do these traditions remind us of the whole counsel of Scripture? 
How are they a benefit? How are they a blessing? Um, and then let that winsome witness appeal to people uh, rather than trying to b browbeat them into uh, our, you know, your position, our position, right? Um, you know, the context there uh, that Paul is speaking in is the, the pagan Roman culture uh, had, you know, well-established observances regarding days, months, seasons, years. And uh, so these are adult converts out of Roman paganism, you know, over into Christianity. And uh, so they were very familiar with that whole sort of a setup and pattern to life. And of course, the Old Testament law has, um, you know, set observances regarding days, months, seasons, and years. And so Paul is concerned that the churches are then trading, trading one form of legalism for another form of legalism. And, you know, Jesus, you know, of course, spoke to this. Um, in uh, Mark 2, verse 27, Jesus said, Sabbath was made for man, uh, not man for the Sabbath. And, you know, the context there is that, uh, the, you know, he's accused his, and his disciples are accused of, of breaking the law in the, and specifically that they were harvesting because they were walking through the field and eating. And uh, they were not harvesting, you know, they were, they were getting a bite to eat. Um, and so the problem was, was that the religious leaders, probably with good intentions, you know, the religious leaders had set up extra fences and extra boundaries around the directions that God has given in Scripture. Uh, in order, you know, probably with good intentions, trying to keep people from falling into sin, okay? But then, but then the problem is, is that then, that then these man-made additions become viewed as, you know, the Word of God. You know, um, in, in vain do they worship me, teaching as precepts the doctrine of men, you know, Scripture says. Um, I do want to, uh, uh, I think we would profit, uh, I want to encourage you to write this down, Hebrews chapter 9, verses 1 through 15, and I'm going to read this for you from the NIV, because I like how the NIV translates verse 15 in particular, it really kind of hits the nail on the head. So Hebrews chapter 9, verses, um, I'm sorry, 11 to 15. Um, uh, no, it is 1 to 15. Uh, Hebrews 9, 1 to 15. Now the first covenant, that's the old covenant, uh, had regulations for worship and an earthly sanctuary. A tabernacle was set up. In its first room was a lampstand and a table with its consecrated bread. This was called the holy place. Behind the second curtain was a room called the Most Holy Place, which had a golden altar of incense, the gold-covered Ark of the Covenant. This Ark contained the gold jar of manna, Aaron's staff that had budded, and the stone tablets of the Covenant. Above the Ark was the cherubim of the glory, overshadowed. So there we are seeing this very elaborate, um, uh, dis you know, elaborate way in which under the Old Covenant, people were supposed to worship God. Right When everything had been arranged like this, the priests entered regularly into the outer room to carry on their ministry, but only the high priest entered the inner room, that only once a year, never without blood, which he offered for himself for the sins the people had committed in ignorance. The Holy Spirit was showing by this that the way into the most holy place had not yet been disclosed, Right, as long as the first tabernacle was still functioning. Important point here. This is an illustration for the present time, indicating that the gifts and sacrifices being offered were not able to clear the conscience of the worshiper, they are only a matter of food and drink and various ceremonial washings, external regulations applying until the time of the new order. Verse 11, but when Christ came as a high priest of the good things that are now already here, he went through the greater and more perfect tabernacle that is not made with human hands, that is to say, is not a part of this creation, Christ did not enter by the means of blood, of the blood of goats and calves, but he entered into the most holy place once for all by his own blood, thus obtaining eternal redemption. The blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of the heifer sprinkled on those who are ceremonially unclean, sanctify them so they are outwardly clean. How much more than with the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciences from acts that lead to death so that we may serve the living God. Now look at, listen to verse 15, super important. For this reason, Christ is the mediator of a new covenant. 
Okay, so there's the old covenant with its rules and regulations regarding worship. And now Christ is the mediator of a new covenant. And in this new covenant, we have freedom. Now, our freedom is guided by scripture. And our freedom, of course, is um, focused to worshiping the one true living God through the shed blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, having been called into this covenant relationship by the work of the Holy Spirit. Therein lies this freedom, okay? So, um, Paul is very concerned um, for the Christians in Galatia. So what would we learn today for our prayers? How does the word of God illuminate our prayer life? What do we see more clearly from this scripture? I think two prayer points I want to submit to you tonight. One, thank you, God, that our righteousness does not come by observing man-made traditions. Thank you, God, that our righteousness is a gift from you. It doesn't come by observing man-made traditions. Thank you, God, for tradition, which highlights scripture and emphasizes your grace. Thank you for that sort of tradition. That sort of tradition can actually be helpful. Thank you for that. Then uh, Galatians chapter 4, verse 12 is the second uh, that we'll look at tonight. Uh, Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Brothers, I entreat you, become as I am, for I also have become as you are. You did me no wrong. Now, that's the ESV translation. That's how many of the uh, translations approach verse 12. Now, what I um, need to point out to you is that uh, one rule regarding published translations that has been fairly universally followed is that when uh, a new translation comes out, obviously it's new because it's going to be different, but one of the rules that's sort of agreed upon by translators whose translations are published is that by and large, they will try to follow the uh, approach regarding the translation of scripture used by previous translators. So, why would they do this? Well, the, it's not a nefarious reason. It's not a conspiracy. It's not a cabal or anything like that. The reason is very, uh, actually, you know, is with good intention. The reason is because um, we don't want Christians to be uh, confused or overwhelmed by a multitude of radically different translations. So that's really the reason behind it. And by and large, it, it's very good. This verse is not one of those times. Uh, unfortunately, this verse is poorly translated. And I, I'm going to give you two um, resources you can check out for yourself regarding this. One is the commentary on Galatians by uh, a man, his last name is Das, D-A-S, Andrew Das. And another book is, is titled Ambiguities. It's written by Troy Martin. You can turn to page 125 of Troy Martin's book and page 451 and following in the Galatians commentary by Das, Andrew Das. And basically, their suggestion is basically to translate it like this, and it's radically different. Um, Paul says, because, Become as I am, because I am not requesting anything of you, and you wronged me. Um, become as I am, because I am not requesting anything of you, you wronged me. Um, so, very different, right? Um, so in both translations, Paul is saying, become as I am. And so I want to just speak to that. Paul is not being arrogant uh, when he says, become as I am, because Paul seeks to imitate Christ. Okay. And so really, Paul is just encouraging us to follow the pattern that Christ has established. Uh, also, I want to speak to this, you know, uh, in the second translation, which is really the, the better translation Paul says, you wronged me, versus the ESV and so many other translations, which says, you did me no wrong. And um, I'm not going to go into how you get to such a dramatically different interpretation. Trust me in this. The second one is the better one. You can look at those two books, and they'll give you some insight into that. Uh, Paul says, you wronged me. Um, what, what is Paul getting at? Paul is simply saying that he is greatly saddened by them turning their back and uh, turning, uh, turning, their turning back uh, to the law. 
And so then how would this inform us in our prayer life? You know, I think we could pray simply, Father, forgive me for wronging those who taught me the gospel. Forgive me for that, for those times when I looked, instead of the gospel, I looked to self-righteousness. Forgive me for that spirit of haughtiness. And um, um, uh, please forgive me for that. Okay, then the final piece we're going to look at here is um, Galatians 4, verse 16. Paul asks a very... Wow, emotionally laden question here in Galatians 4.16. Paul says, have I then become your enemy by telling you the truth? Um, you know, it's never easy to tell someone a truth that is not flattering. You know, if we've ever, you know, when we've been in that situation where we've had to tell somebody a truth that's not flattering, it's nothing that any of us relish. It's not something we look for the opportunity to do. It's, it's, never, uh, it's never easy. Um, Paul, Paul, on the one hand, can be certain that he is speaking the truth. Why? Because he is speaking scripture. And so I think therein lies a caution for you and I. Because sometimes we think we are telling someone the truth, but what we thought was the truth was based on fake news, right? was based on our emotions, was based on half of the facts, was based on whatever. And so I think we want to be very careful with that. Um, what's going on here is that, again, enemies, have con enemies of Paul have convinced the Christians in Galatia that the Apostle Paul's preaching was deficient. They have come in after Paul, by the Holy Spirit, has done all this work and established these churches and drawn people unto Christ, right? By the power of the Holy Spirit, word and sacrament ministry. And, but they've come in and they have told these people that the Apostle Paul's preaching was deficient. Preachers have feelings too. And uh, Paul's feelings are hurt. His feelings are hurt here. You know, an old preacher uh, once said, that uh, to be a preacher means you have to have thick skin, but a soft heart. You have to have thick skin, but a soft heart. And I, I try to follow this good advice. Um, some days I do better than others. Um, some days it really just plain hurts. But we, we, we have to have a thick skin, uh, but a soft heart. Um, and so, you know, what's a, a prayer point for us today? You know, Father, help me show those with spiritual responsibility for me that I appreciate their gospel teaching and preaching. And so who are those that have spiritual responsibility for me? Well, the way God has established things, the, the first people that have spiritual responsibility for you in your life would be your parents. And so uh, it would be very appropriate for us to say a prayer uh, of thanks uh, and uh, for those who, for our parents. And, and if our parents have already gone to be with the Lord, then a prayer of thanks to God for them, for how they raised us up in the Lord. Also, others who have spiritual responsibility for us are our Sunday school teachers. And so parents, I want to encourage you to, to lift up the Sunday school teachers in your church, in your prayers and, uh, and drop them a note, drop them a card. Uh, also, you know, if your church is fortunate enough to have a youth worker, uh, your, your youth worker, youth workers, um, have a spiritual responsibility uh, for you. Your pastor does. Um, for us, uh, we have a, a bishop, a district president who oversees a regional area, and uh, they have a spiritual responsibility over the churches in that area. And then, of course, we have a national church president who has spiritual responsibility for us. And so we, you know, Father, uh, help me to show those with spiritual responsibility for me that I appreciate their gospel teaching and preaching. And so as they are pointing me to Christ, to Christ crucified, to Christ resurrected, to, to the, the gospel, to God's grace, to the righteousness that's mine in Christ, thank you, God, for that. Thank you for them. Strengthen them and build them up and uh, give them the strength for the, the ministry before them. Uh, this is Pastor Appreciation Month, and I, I have received so many thank yous 
Uh, I am very thankful for all of your thank yous. And so I, I praise God for you. And I praise God for the opportunity to do these devotions at night. Um, because God's word is where the power is. Because where God's word is, there is the Holy Spirit. Um, they are inseparably linked. And uh, faith comes through hearing the word. Amen? Amen. So I want to pray God's richest blessings on your evening and I look forward to being with you tomorrow night as we continue um, with Galatians chapter 4. We'll be wrapping up Galatians chapter 4 tomorrow night. And um, I pray God's richest blessings upon you. So let's go in peace. Let's serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good night.